This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Florida's general election day is less than two weeks away. Let's meet the candidates. Rally 2020 begins now. This original program is provided as a public service by WSRE, the League of Women Voters, and Pensacola State College. Good evening and welcome to Rally 2020. I'm Molly Barrows with WSRE-TV and I will be joined this evening by Sandra Averhart with WUWF Public Media. Rally 2020 election coverage is provided as a public service by WSRE-TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Rally is also being simulcast on News Radio 1620 and 92.3 FM. The general election is November 3rd. Tonight, you'll meet the candidates running for local, state, and federal offices, including U.S. Congress District 1, State Senator District 1, and State Representative Districts 1, 2, 3, and 4. You'll also hear from the candidates in the races for Escambia County Sheriff, Escambia County Tax Collector, and Okaloosa County Commissioner District 5. Joining me now is WUWF's Sandra Averhart. Thank you, Molly. Because of COVID-19 constraints, this year, WSRE has produced Rally differently than in years past. Traditionally, Rally has aired live, with candidates for each race seated side by side. In this year's primary and general election editions of Rally, the candidates were recorded individually, as well as your hosts, while observing COVID-19 precautions. This year, 19 candidates for federal, state, and local offices in Escambia and Okaloosa counties were invited to participate in the general election edition of Rally. They were provided with two questions prepared by the League of Women Voters. This month, a total of 15 candidates came to WSRE to respond to those questions and record a two-minute closing statement about their candidacy. The candidates were given up to 45 seconds to answer each of the league's two questions. When necessary, a warning bell was sounded at 40 seconds and three bells indicated that the time limit had been reached. Candidates were given a maximum of two minutes to make their closing statements. When necessary, a warning bell was sounded at 1 minute 45 seconds and three bells indicated the two minute time limit had been reached. Unlike previous editions of Rally, this year candidates did not hear the responses and statements of their opponents because they were all recorded individually and therefore did not have an opportunity to make rebuttals. We begin tonight with the race for the seat for U.S. Congress District 1. This congressional district includes Escambia, Santa Rosa, Okaloosa, and Walton counties, and a portion of Holmes County. There are three congressional candidates on the ballot. In alphabetical order, those congressional candidates are Mr. Phil Ayer, Democrat, Mr. Matt Gates, Republican, and Mr. Albert Orem with no party affiliation. Again, they were given 45 seconds each to answer two questions provided by the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area and two minutes to give a final statement on their candidacy. The first question is, in 2016, the annual deficit was $587 billion. This year, before the COVID-19 pandemic, the deficit was almost double that amount, $1.83 trillion. Please give your opinion on how Congress can get control of such dramatic increases. The next question is, what specific steps will you be taking to help unify rather than further divide our nation during this very partisan period of our history? We begin in alphabetical order with Mr. Phil Ayer. As a military planner, I understand the strategic risk to a bloated and growing debt. As a former Republican, I remember a time when we prioritized balancing the budget. We don't hear about that much anymore. Our latest tax cuts for the rich did not help. I recognize that balancing the budget won't be smooth sailing, but Congress must get back to making some tough decisions by strengthening our long-term planning and getting out of short-term planning in crisis, in crisis mode. My guideposts will be the responsibilities enshrined in the Constitution and enacted in law, 
with always Northwest Floridians and everyday Americans as the priority. Look, our nation is hurting, and our elected leaders have a role to play in healing our wounds by reflecting on our respective faiths and the wisdom of our founding fathers in our documents. Our, my opponent's behavior shows that he is not reflective of his faith nor of our reflecting documents. So I, the way forward is to focus on George Washington's uh, warning and get back to the political creed of country over party. I'll convene inclusive town halls, listen, and make sure that we're focusing on good jobs, beaches, veteran services, and more. I'm fighting to restore Northwest Florida's honor and the integrity of our representation. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. To know what kind of congressman I will be, I need to take you back to a day in 1989 at the height of the Cold War in my service in the Navy. We were a naval air crew flying alone and unafraid into the, un, into the teeth of the Soviet war machine. A pair of Soviet armed fighters intercepted, flashed their missiles, and ordered us to depart. But we stayed the course. The hostile fighters maneuvered aggressively, blasted their exhaust into our engines, tossing us around, risking collision, and compromising our ability to maintain course and altitude. The danger was real, but we remained on station to capture the signals that revealed what the Russians tried to hide. Now that was just one in a long series of classified reconnaissance missions flown day after day and year upon year for decades to keep the Cold War from turning hot. I learned a great deal from my naval service. First, vision is mission critical. We simply cannot fight an enemy we can't see, whether that enemy is North Korea's nuclear threat, COVID-19, or global warming. Signals we reported up the chain of command saved lives and made America stronger. We need leaders in Washington with their eyes open, prepared to act. Second, risk factors in everything worthwhile. Those who live financially privileged and risk-free lives find it difficult to understand the integrity and sacrifice required for a life of public service. We need people in Washington we trust to stand for what is right, even when it's not popular. Third, people there's, there's no substitute for people. We have the mightiest fighting force in the world because of our smart, ethical, and brave men and women who are out there every day keeping us safe. That's why I'm in this race. As your reconnaissance officer, I recognize the grave danger in our current course. Duty compels me to sound the alarm and change course with fresh, competent leadership in Washington. I'll work with the new president and new speaker of the house when they're right and stand up to them when they're wrong. So I'm humbly asking you to trust me to represent you so we together can move Northwest Florida forward with honor. That was Mr. Phil Ayer. Now we'll hear from Mr. Matt Gates. I've voted against bloated budgets, whether they were introduced by Democrats or Republicans during my four years as Northwest Florida's congressman. The challenging thing is that in Washington, the way to get control of spending is to get control of the special interests that gorge on that spending at the expense of Americans. It's why I'm the only Republican running to return to the United States Congress who hasn't taken any money and has sworn off PAC donations, special interest PAC donations. And so if we're ever able to push back against those PACs and special interests, I believe we can restore our country, solve our debt problems. I will never support a sequestration that holds our military hostage because other parts of the government can't seem to spend accurately, appropriately, and responsibly. In America, our differences do matter. Right now, we see socialism versus capitalism, freedom versus whatever this woketopia is that they're developing in Portland and hoping to export to the rest of the country. But our common destiny as Americans matters so much more. 
I believe we can be united in patriotism and in the policies that I work with the president on to put America and the American people first. I also think in Northwest Florida, the environment is critically important to bring people together. It's why I've introduced a green real deal to ensure that we're able to preserve America's splendor and ensure that uh, we enjoy and benefit from the greatness of our country and our community. And I think focusing on the environment would be a great way to bring Americans together. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. I want to thank WSRE and the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. And I want to thank my fellow Northwest Floridians for giving me the opportunity to serve you for the last four years in Congress. When I was elected to this job, my top priority was to ensure that we extended the ban on offshore oil drilling to protect our way of life, from our property values to our vibrant tourism industry, to most importantly, our military mission and the important research and development that goes on in our community that enhances Northwest Florida's contribution to the fight. During my time as our Congressman, we've built new airplane hangars out at Hurlburt. We've had new capabilities at Whiting Field for uh, the fantastic pilots training there. Research funding at Eglin Air Force Base continues to be stronger than ever, and we get more and more military families who continue to call Northwest Florida home each and every year. I take no obligation as Northwest Florida's congressman more seriously than my obligation to do right by the military families who express an elite level of patriotism. It's why I want to make sure that when we do go and fight, we've got the resources, tools, and weaponry to win decisively every single time. But it's also why I want to make sure that our military is not overexerted and overdeployed in places where, frankly, we've been trading villages back and forth with evildoers for far too long. I want to bring more Northwest Florida fighters home uh, to be here in our country with their families. And I think under the Trump doctrine, under the president's leadership, and through our great cooperation, the best days for America and the best days for Northwest Florida are still to come. That was Mr. Matt Gates. Now Mr. Albert Orm responds to the same question. Pass a balanced budget amendment, reform government to save money, rewrite the tax code so billionaires pay taxes. This was my platform in 2002 when I ran. It is again. Politicians are addicted to giving you something for nothing, a free lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You pay one way or the other, and you pay more. And it can't go on forever, and it won't. It's a simple idea. It can be done. It will eventually be done, or there will be a crisis. MakeAmericaMorePerfect.org. Thank you. Purge the hate. Today, politicians are too lazy to lead, instead pandering to fear, anger, and hatred. People of my generation inherited a great country from our parents and our grandparents. Not perfect, we have problems, but we've always been able to solve our problems through dialogue and debate. Now, we have partisan politics and gridlock in Washington. Politicians blame each other for problems instead of trying to resolve them. They criticize and vilify those who do not agree with them. We can do better. I will dare to lead to build consensus and alliances to make America more perfect. MakeAmericaMorePerfect.org, Don'tVoteHate.org. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. MakeAmericaMorePerfect.org, Don'tVoteHate.org. You may hear other slogans, but our future is not behind us. Why do some countries succeed and others fail? There are many things that could be said, but I've posted this on Facebook the past two years. This country is not great because it was ever perfect or complete or finished, but because it continually strives to be better. Even our founding fathers knew this. The Constitution of the United States begins with these words. We, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure tranquility, to secure the blessings of liberty, to ordain and establish the Constitution. 
If you believe this like I do, we can do anything. I'm Albert Orem. My father was in the Navy, I was in the Navy, I was a Navy spouse for 20 years. I graduated from the Naval Academy in 1981 and Navy Flight School. I will dare to lead, to build consensus and alliances, to make America more perfect. When you vote, please remember, don't vote hate. And remember Lori.org. Shame on you, Matt, for failing to defend Lori Klausutis. She was your neighbor and your constituent. Yet you remain silent as Trump defames this woman who was totally devoted to her husband and sang in the choir at church. Mr. Goetz, there have been an average of a thousand deaths each day from COVID-19, yet Trump has ignored, denied, and downplayed COVID-19 138 times. In early March, you wore a gas mask in Congress to laugh and mock at it. All I can say is he will never change with so many people who ignore these traits, or worse yet, cheer him on. I would be privileged to represent all of Northwest Florida in Washington, make America moreperfect.org. That was Mr. Albert Orem, and those are the candidates for U.S. Congress District 1. Now we turn to the race for State Representative District 1. There are two candidates in this race. They are Ms. Francine C. Mathis, Democrat, and Ms. Michelle Salzman, Republican. All the candidates in the state races responded to questions provided by the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area and by the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa and Walton Counties. The first question is, the pandemic has created adverse health and economic consequences for Floridians. What specific solutions do you support to deal with both of these problems? The second question is, in response to the killing of George Floyd and the resulting social unrest, what changes are needed to the laws that govern criminal justice in Florida? Our first candidate in alphabetical order is Ms. Francine C. Mathis. Well, for the health care, I do believe that we all need um, fair and better health care for all. Um, I am a big, firm believer that, especially with this coronavirus, everyone needs the opportunity to be able to go to the hospital, get the medications that they need to be able to survive this pandemic. Um, as we know, this uh, coronavirus has taken a lot of lives, not only in Escambia County, but all over this country. So I do support health care for all. Um, as far as economic consequences for Floridians, we have had a very bad economical downfall. Um, I think that uh, we need to receive more money than $1,200 so we can be able to put some of that in our revenue. We definitely need to make laws that will end chokeholds. I would definitely, you know, be willing to write a bill for that. And we also need to make a law to where once a person has been uh, handcuffed and obtained, there's no need to slam them to the ground and put your knee in their neck. That need to be definitely outlawed. As well as when things like this happen, our officers need to be prosecuted to the fullest just as we would be prosecuted to the fullest if we murdered somebody out on the street. So um, I think those are just a couple of the criminal justice laws in Florida that I would definitely give thumbs up to do. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. Uh, my name is Brian St. Mathis and I'm running for State House Representative for District 1. I've lived in District 1 all my life, so I know the issues and I know the concerns. I am a proud U.S. Army mom, so I do support our soldiers. I do support our veterans. Uh, we have had a pandemic for the last 10 months now, and we've gone through a lot. And I do want to thank my community and my district for leading the way and taking care of one another, for helping out with the community and helping people get back on their feet. I am ready to go to Tallahassee, and I'm ready to fight and bring ethics, integrity, 
commitment, consistency, and equality to all the people in District 1. So let's lead the way together and help in one another, and let's help each other have a great day and a better tomorrow. I thank you and vote for me November 3rd, 2020. That was Ms. Francine C. Mathis. Ms. Michelle Salzman is our next candidate. I plan to work alongside our hospitals and medical experts moving towards recovery as we continue to navigate these unprecedented times. It's imperative that we find balance in public safety, personal safety, mental health, and economic welfare of ourselves and of our government. I want to work with my fellow lawmakers to protect businesses from senseless COVID-19 lawsuits, while also holding negligent businesses accountable um, that put people in harm's way. Economic prosperity depends on communities with dependable basic services, but also where the quality of life encourages businesses and individuals to flourish. I will do everything I can in Tallahassee to bring hard-earned tax dollars back to District 1 for economic recovery. What happened to George Floyd was murder. Our situation in Escambia County does not reflect Minneapolis, Chicago, or Baltimore. We're Pensacola. Our community respects the police and they do what they can for our citizens. I feel that PPD and the Escambia County Sheriff's Office deserve a lot of credit. I support them and they support me. I'm endorsed by the Police Benevolent Association. As far as criminal justice reform goes, I feel that Florida is headed down the right path. Florida legislatures last year approved a package of reforms to the outdated criminal justice system. Our country does a good job of correcting juvenile first-time offenders. Our officials make an effort to enforce civil citations rather than arrest. And I believe it is important to give children a second chance. That concludes the questions. Now time for the closing statement. District 1 has been left behind for far too long and the leadership in Tallahassee needs to know that you're just as important as the citizens of Miami and Jacksonville. I want better opportunities for our children. I will fight hard for our fair share. This campaign is about the future. I am more confident than ever that I can bring prosperity to District 1. I'm very proud of the army of volunteers that are fighting by my side. You'll recognize them in the red shirts all around the county. We work hard and accomplish a lot, and the accomplishments we did during Hurricane Sally were unprecedented. We facilitated and coordinated supply distributions from Century to Beulah to areas in the south end of the community. 21,000 tarps, 5,000 cases of water, a pallet of chainsaw, ch several pallets of ice, and over a thousand hot meals, and I'm just a nominee. I'm extremely excited about the coalition we are building on the Panhandle. We now have a unified front of representatives willing to work together. I'm currently working alongside Representatives Andrade, Williamson, Shove, and others to expand opportunities for all of us. That's right, us. What brought us here is the same thing that will move us forward, our community working together. For the past 15 years, I've brought in millions of dollars every year, trained thousands of community leaders, and built coalitions, as well as helped build extremely successful businesses and nonprofits. Now, I'm asking every citizen of Escambia County to join me in a partnership to build better roads and infrastructure, create exceptional social services, safety, and prepare for our bright future. We will work together to build what we need and fix what's broke. I need you to get out there and do your part. I'm asking the residents of District 1 to vote on November 3rd for me, Michelle Salzman, for Florida House. If we can capture this promise together, we can accomplish anything that comes our way. That was Ms. Michelle Salzman, and those are your two candidates for Florida House of Representatives, District 1. Coming up later on Rally, the race for Florida's District 1 Senate seat. But first, we'll meet the candidates running for Escambia County Sheriff and State House of Representatives, District 2, right after this break. Welcome to this year's Rally, presented by WSRE-TV. I'm Jane Spruill, president of the Pensacola Bay Area, League of Women Voters. For over 30 years, our local leagues have provided the candidate questions for events like this forum. The League supports democracy, which is designed for active participation in government. 
Being an informed voter is an important way to support democracy. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, which means we do not support nor oppose parties or candidates. This year, more than 700 League chapters across the country celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which gives women the right to vote. At the same time, the League of Women Voters was organized. The League has continued to work these hundred years to understand policy issues and to encourage active and informed citizens to participate in government by voting. This rally is one way to make accurate and nonpartisan information available to voters. We also provide a guide to understanding the amendments and other ballot issues. We invite women and men to our public events or to join the local league as a member. Please refer to the contact information listed here on your screen to learn more. The Pensacola Bay Area League of Women Voters appreciates your efforts to be an informed voter. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Escambia County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on Election Day. To vote by mail, ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections office by 7 p.m. on Election Day. The general election takes place on Tuesday, November 3rd. The U.S. Postal Service recommends allowing one week for mail delivery. The Supervisor of Elections office is located at 213 Palafox Place in downtown Pensacola. Early voting began on Monday, October 19th and continues through Saturday, October 31st. Early voting takes place at the times and locations listed there on your screen, and there are early voting locations in the northern, southern, eastern, and western regions of Escambia County. Photo and signature ID are required. On the day of the general election, which is Tuesday, November 3rd, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 in the morning until 7 at night. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring your photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to Rally 2020, a candidate forum provided by WSRE as a public service to help voters get to know the candidates. Tonight, each candidate is answering questions provided by the League of Women Voters. And just a reminder that due to COVID-19, this rally program is not the usual live forum we've had in years past. The candidates pre-recorded their responses individually, among other precautions against the coronavirus, and therefore did not have the opportunity to make any rebuttals. We turn now to the race for Escambia County Sheriff. There are two candidates in this race. In alphabetical order, they are Mr. David Alexander III, Democrat, and Mr. Chip Simmons, Republican. They are each answering the same questions and providing a closing statement. The first question is this. As a candidate for sheriff, we are sure that you are constantly thinking about promoting the safety and welfare of the citizens of Escambia County. Briefly, what would you consider to be your top three priorities for the Escambia County Sheriff's Office to address immediately upon your being elected? The next question is nationally, ethnic and racial groups have been targeted for arrest. What steps can be taken in Escambia County to prevent this kind of ethnic and racial profiling? We begin with Mr. David Alexander III. As a newly elected sheriff, uh, I would start off by the process of transforming our sheriff's department. And I would focus on these three priorities. The first thing I would do is put an end to public corruption through transparency, using professionalism, integrity, uh, fairness, and accountability. The next thing I would do is do a thorough assessment of our sheriff's department to make sure that policies and practices are in alignment to support the uh, partnerships and also the problem solving in the communities we serve. Lastly, I would uh, advance our crime fighting efforts in neighborhoods by increasing uh, the interaction between deputies and the citizens that we protect. To prevent this from happening, as a newly appointed sheriff, I would make sure that all personnel 
has been given training in implicit bias. The next step would be to, to make sure that we hire and we recruit the right people to do the job of serving and protecting our citizens. And the last thing is that we need to make sure that from the top to the bottom, everyone is held accountable for doing what we have trained to do, that's to serve and protect our citizens. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. Prior to finishing my 32-year career in law enforcement with the city, I began to talk with citizens throughout Escambia County. And certainly, uh, hearing them, uh, there were a lot of major concerns uh, that was brought to the forefront. And actually, when you look at the last three terms of this administration, uh, we see that constantly in the news, there's been a lack of accountability, a lack of professionalism, a lack of fairness, and a lack of um, integrity that's been displayed in our Scammon County Sheriff Department. I've heard those complaints, I've heard those concerns, and that's why I made it clear that I was gonna run as a candidate who would protect and serve everyone in Escambia County. And that's why even to this day, uh, this has been a long, uh, challenging campaign with all the different things uh, that we have faced with the pandemic, uh, also with Hurricane Sally. But you know what? That kind of gives you an idea of what the citizens, the taxpayers in this county has gone through, not just in this year, 2020, but in the last three terms. A lot of uncertainties, a lot of doubt, a lot of lack of, of information. And what I want to do as David Alexander, the next sheriff of Escambia County, is make sure people are informed about the things that affect them so that they can appropriately respond and be prepared to work with their sheriff's department. Right now, there's a lack of trust. And I want to be the one that restore that trust of all citizens into the Escambia County Sheriff's Department so that together we can make Escambia County one of the best places to live and reside because we're doing it together. And that's why to, it, it's, it's time for a citizens to stop gambling with your public safety, cash in your chips, and vote David Alexander as your next sheriff of Escambia County. That was Mr. David Alexander III. Our next candidate is Mr. Chip Simmons. I think that the, the first priority would be to deal with the violent crime which is associated with the drug trafficking. I have a lot of experience in working drug trafficking cases. I've been on a number of task forces working with federal authorities, so I know how to get that done. The second priority, I would say, is the use of technology. There are a lot of technological advances that we can use at the sheriff's office, which includes fingerprints, DNA, all that sort of thing, that I think that we can uh, work a little bit smarter rather than just work harder. And the third uh, priority, I would say, is engagement. Engagement has always been a part of our platform, and our engagement would involve town hall meetings. Our engagement would be to the work with uh, our neighborhoods and try to get a feel for what, what they need from the sheriff's office. I think that any law enforcement agency should insist on the fair and equitable enforcement of the laws. We do this through a series of, of uh, safeguards, one of which is the body camera program, and one uh, is the in-car body cam camera program. And this allows us to search and research every single traffic stop, search and research every single use of force, for look for a potential bias. If a bias is detected, we would address it immediately. As the sheriff, we will not tolerate any police action, any law enforcement action that has its basis in bias or profiling. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. I'm Chip Simmons and I'm running for sheriff of Escambia County because Escambia County deserves a sheriff that is the most qualified, the most educated, the most prepared. I've been in law enforcement for over 35 years. I've commanded the department's narcotics unit and the department's SWAT team. I know how to reduce crime. As police chief, I established the agency's very first camera program and attained the agency's first accreditation. I am one of the most decorated officers in department history. I have a master's degree in public administration and I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy. 
I have been a certified corrections officer, the chief corrections officer, and assistant county administrator. No other candidate comes anywhere close to my qualifications. I've done the job. Under my leadership, we will have a robust enforcement and engagement strategy that will enforce and ensure the safety of Escambia County for years to come. We need a sheriff that is committed to courtesy, integrity, and professionalism. I have the endorsement of the people that you trust, the deputies, the firefighters, the NRA, all local accomplished law enforcement leaders, and the Attorney General of the State of Florida. Now is not the time to compromise on qualifications, and certainly not the time to compromise on your safety. On November the 3rd, vote for someone that you know. Vote for qualifications. Vote for vision. And vote for your future. Vote for me, Chip Simmons. Our safety depends on it. That was Mr. Chip Simmons, and that concludes the race for Escambia County Sheriff. Now let's meet the candidates for Florida House District 2. This district covers parts of Escambia and Santa Rosa counties. There are two candidates in this race, and we'll introduce them to you in alphabetical order. The first candidate is Mr. Alex Andrade, Republican. The next candidate is Ms. Diane Crummel, Democrat. They responded to the following questions. The first one is, the pandemic has created adverse health and economic consequences for Floridians. What specific solutions do you support to deal with both of these problems? The second question is, in response to the killing of George Floyd and the resulting social unrest, what changes are needed to the laws that govern criminal justice in Florida? We begin with Mr. Andrade. According to the Cato Institute, Florida ranks out as the freest state in the country. While our approach to COVID-19 has been derided by many in the media, it's resulted in far less loss of life than states like New York, New Jersey, and California, who impose much more restrictive COVID-19 responses. As we begin to, to enter the phase where we expect and rely upon personal and corporate responsibility to address COVID-19, Florida and Florida state government needs to rely and return to the things that made Florida the economic engine that it is. Uh, we must redouble down on making sure that our environment is, is clean and protected. It's our main economic driver. And we must also return to the education system and make sure that our students are not missing out on losses. First and foremost, it's important for everyone viewing at home to remember and understand that uh, regardless of your political affiliation, President Trump, Governor DeSantis, even our own Sheriff Morgan, all decried the murder of George Floyd as what it was, a murder. It was a horrendous act. We need to first and fundamentally remember that we're Americans first. We're not related to a party affiliation or a, a minority or ma majority uh, racial profile. Um, we're Americans first. We expect our Constitution to do what it does. But we can focus on bipartisan policies that are supported across the board, like body cameras, increased training, a focus on qualified immunity, and making sure that we return our prison systems to rehabilitation rather than focus on punishment. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. Hello. My name is Alex Andrade, and I've had the honor of representing you in the Florida legislature since 2018. I've sat down with families after they'd lost everything in hurricanes, witnessed the scene in the moments after three young Americans paid the ultimate sacrifice for their friends and their country at NAS Pensacola, and comforted hundreds of constituents as they faced losing their jobs and their life's work due to COVID-19. We are facing a difficult time here in Northwest Florida and in our country. And in the face of those difficult times, you deserve leaders who put you first. Whether you believe, like me, in the right to life, and we oppose abortion, or the Second Amendment, and limited government, or not, I know I'm the only candidate in this race who understands what it takes to actually fight for our environment, our veterans, our students, and our community at large. I know this because I've been doing it for the past two years. Northwest Florida is strong, it's resilient, it's filled with families who love God and love this country. And for that reason alone, I'm confident we will ride out these current storms and be ready for a brighter future on the horizon. As we look towards that brighter future, it's my sincere hope and prayer that on November 3rd, you'll allow me the privilege to serve you for another two years. 
That was Mr. Alex Andrade. Our next candidate is Miss Diane Crummel. I would rely on the public health experts and epidemiologists that know how to best protect our public health. And I'm not a public health expert, but I understand the power of those who have spent their entire life dedicated to the study of science and why their knowledge is so powerful in helping us to keep the economy going and to recover in the safest way possible. I would support public health driven policy solutions to prevent and address the continued health consequences of COVID. We need to see that people have health care and that they have access to care because we know when we have healthy, safe communities, you have a better workforce. And we know that our work Force depends on us to be able to recover from this. We need communities where everyone is treated with respect and dignity. This is a corner, the cornerstone of the most basic principles of human rights and justice. I believe our communities prosper best when we focus on policies that uh, support a healthy, safe, and educated people. I would support legislation that invests more resources and develops explicit plans to increase fairness, equity, and justice in every aspect of daily lives, from accessible and affordable quality health care to education to affordable housing to better wages and more jobs, as well as focusing on policies that improve our criminal justice system. We need to invest in better training and pay for our law enforcement to attract talent, and I would support policies to incentivize our law enforcement officers to work in communities they serve. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. My name is Diane Cromwell, and I'm a lifelong resident of Pensacola. After graduating from UWF, I started my own successful small business that spanned 35 years. My father, Dan Crummel, was Northwest Florida Regional Planning Director for years, and my mother, Vivian Crummel, has been active in charitable organizations her entire life. I learned at an early age the importance of putting community and people first. Over the years, I've been out in the community listening and talking with folks about issues that are important to them. I've attended countless local meetings and town halls, speaking out on their behalf to ensure that their voices and their concerns were heard. This community is part of who I am. And this brings us to where we are today. Our communities are reeling from the devastation of COVID and a major hurricane. And our small businesses have been decimated over the destruction of the Bay Bridge. Yet my opponent remains silent. On top of that, Florida had a broken unemployment system that left out desperately needed help for tens of thousands of people. And it took more than 10 days to get FEMA to help the victims of our last hurricane. This is just unacceptable. People's lives have been turned upside down. We we have the highest unemployment since the Great Depression, and businesses are going bankrupt every day. The bottom line for the people here is my opponent claims to represent them. But when it came time to do the actual work of the people, my opponent was nowhere to be found. And this has been a consistent theme for him. But folks know two things about me. I'm not afraid to stand up for the people, and I'm proven leadership. When it came time to save Pensacola Beach from privatization, I stepped up and organized a grassroots movement that brought the people together to save our beloved beaches for everyone. We can continue to work together to build on and use the same kind of energy and commitment that united us to save Pensacola um, to rebuild our community and our economy. I will work night and day, committed like I have on other issues in this community that we have won on, and continue to win for the people that live here, because together we've proven that we can accomplish anything we set our minds out to do. I'm Diane Crummel, and I'm asking for your vote on November 3rd for Florida State House District 2. That was Miss Diane Crummel, and those are your candidates for Florida House District 2. We're taking a break on rally. When we return, meet the candidates running for Escambia County Tax Collector and State Representative District 3. There is nothing more important to our democratic process than having an informed electorate voting on Election Day. Good evening, I am Ed Meadows, President of Pensacola State College, thanking you for tuning into this rally a joint presentation of the League of Women Voters, WSRE-TV, and Pensacola State College. Rally allows you the opportunity to watch and listen as this election year's slate of candidates answer the tough questions concerning the needs of our community. WSRE, a service of Pensacola State College, 
is proud to bring this program to you as a public service. And as always, we invite your comments and suggestions about how we can further fulfill our community obligations. Let's all remember the importance of participating in the governance process by voting in the upcoming election. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Santa Rosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections office by 7 p.m. on election day. The office is located on Caroline Street in Milton. The general election takes place on Tuesday, November 3rd. The U.S. Postal Service recommends allowing one week for mail delivery. Mail ballots may also be placed in drop boxes at the early voting sites during the early voting period. Early voting began on Monday, October 19th and continues through Saturday, October 31st at six locations in Milton, Pace, Gulf Breeze, and Navarre. Early voting hours each day are 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. and the early voting locations are listed on screen. Photo and signature ID are required. On the day of the general election, Tuesday, November 3rd, voting takes place from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring your photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back to Rally 2020, and thank you for joining us. Tonight, we've heard from candidates for U.S. Congress and Escambia County Sheriff, as well as Florida House of Representatives District 1 and 2. It's now time to meet the candidates for Escambia County Tax Collector and Florida House District 3. We start with the race for Escambia Tax Collector. There are two candidates in this race. In alphabetical order, they are Mr. Scott Lunsford, Republican, and Ms. Wendy D. Rich with no party affiliation. They were given 45 seconds to answer each of the questions provided by the League of Women Voters of the Pensacola Bay Area, as well as time to make closing remarks. The first question is, if elected to this office, what will be your top priorities and what will you do to address these priorities? The second question is, what actions would you propose to increase efficiency and improve access to tax collector services, especially for citizens who do not have internet services, in situations that might prevent face-to-face -face contact with the public, such as national disaster or emergencies like COVID-19? We begin with Mr. Scott Lunsford. Since 2016, my priorities have been conservative budgeting, expanding online services, and reducing transaction time. In four years, we have saved millions of dollars. After moving into our new Marcus Point office next year, we will save millions more over the life of the building, and not only that, but provide a much better experience for customers visiting that office. Part of providing a positive customer experience includes further expansion of our online services. Since taking office, I have introduced same-day registration pickups and business tax receipts, among many more. We're working with vendors on a new mobile app and online printing of electronic titles. Both of these transactions will re further reduce time and make doing business with our office much more convenient. Thank you. The greatest efficiencies can be realized through online services and mobile applications. However, I'm very empathetic to those in our community who lack internet access and adequate transportation. It's for those reasons I partnered with the state several years ago to bring mobile licensing to mobile offices to our remote areas of the county. These have been so successful that the state has agreed to partner with me to be the first county ever to own our own mobile offices to provide services to these customers. It'll not only let us serve underserved areas of Gamby County often, it will also allow us to react quicker and faster after a natural disaster. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. When 2020 began, we could have not known it would bring us so many firsts. 
For the first time, we were asked to physically distance, wear masks, and limit our social gatherings. These changes were soon followed by an economic recession, not caused by poor policy or a stock market, but by a pandemic like we've never seen. As you can imagine, these events created some challenges for our office and the way we serve the public. Throughout this pandemic, we have constantly adjusted, adapted, and made decisions based on the best information on hand and following the guidance of local health authorities. We made a very difficult decision when we closed our lobbies in March, but we never stopped working for you. In the first few weeks of the closure, we waited on over 30,000 customers contactless through our drive throughs websites, phones, emails, and our callback queues. When a few weeks later we opened up our first lobby, we were the first in the state to reopen to the public and we were very mindful of social distancing and guidelines. Through my guidance, experience, and innovation, we were the first tax collector office in Florida to return to offering road tests. Again, using an outdoor contactless driving range, we've been able to test over 2,000 drivers. We're also the first in the state to offer concealed weapons services after the pandemic closed state and county offices, many of which remain closed today. While this challenging year has been a year of first, we have found ways to adapt and continue serving the citizens of Escambia County. As our life begins to return to some version of normal, our county will need strong and experienced leaders now more than ever. On November the 3rd, I would be honored to have your vote as we continue improving and innovating into the future. Again, I'm Scott Lunsford. Please visit votescottlunsford.com. Like our page on Facebook. Thank you. That was Mr. Scott Lunsford. Our next candidate is Ms. Wendy D. Rich. After speaking to many citizens, my top priorities as your tax connect collector, excuse me, would initially be to improve efficiency at the office <clears throat> and services, extend hours of operation, and help to meet people's needs. Um, increase the services that are already offered there and possibly new locations to modify the existing locations to better meet the current needs. Um, public accessibility to Wi-Fi to help better streamline services within the office and cross training of the employees to help in additional areas. I would make sure that we have call centers in effect and ready to go. Um, also, maybe mobile internet units to have them available in the time of a disaster or just like with COVID, the situation that we've been placed up against, um, as well as even possibly having mobile units to be able to take into different areas that are capable to do a lot of the needs that have to be taken care of, along with being able to help direct people wherever they need to go and answer questions or give them information that they may be needing. That concludes the questions. Now time for a closing statement. Good day, my name is Wendy Rich and I'm running for your new tax collector. This will be my first job as a public servant in a government capacity. I believe that government service should not be a lifetime position, but a position of service after a lifetime of experience. I truly believe that after serving the public in many business related positions, that I can offer the citizens of Escambia County a fresh perspective on what your tax collector position should be. This is your office, not the person's name on the door and I intend on ensuring that this is my first priority in the job. I have lived and been educated in Escambia County my whole life and believe that my ties to the community will also help to ensure that I do a good job. My goals as your tax collector are straightforward and I believe will greatly improve your time and experience in this office. My first goal will be to improve the efficiency of the office. In my opinion, this can be improved in several ways cross training of employees to be capable to work at several stations if one gets overloaded or needs assistance. I would also like to ensure that we have done everything possible to complete your needs in a timely fashion and that the need was done correctly the first time. I would also like to ensure that each location has the ability to cover all needs of the customer so that you don't have to bounce from one location to the next. Extended hours of operation on a rotating basis would also help with customers who can't always be in the office during the normal business hours. This would also include opening drive-in, drive-through locations, open on Saturday and on a rotational basis throughout the county. 
I would like to be able to meet the needs of the special customers and difficult requests in a timely fashion as well. I will always remember that this is your office and that I will serve at your pleasure and would love the opportunity to show you what this office can become. For more detailed information, you can go to www.electwendyrich.com. That was Wendy D. Rich, and those are your candidates for Escambia County Tax Collector. We now turn to the race for Florida House District 3, which covers parts of Santa Rosa and Okaloosa counties. There are two candidates in this race. In alphabetical order, they are Ms. Angela L. Hoover, Democrat, and Mr. Jayer Williamson, Republican. Mr. Williamson is not attending rally. These are the two questions. First, the pandemic has created adverse health and economic consequences for Floridians. What specific solutions do you support to deal with both of these problems? The second question. In response to the killing of George Floyd and the resulting social unrest, what changes are needed to the laws that govern criminal justice in Florida? We'll now hear from Ms. Angela L. Hoover. Thank you for that very important question. We can address both of these issues by starting where we should have in the beginning, using unbiased data for a set of resolutions that may not apply to all communities. We have to consider long-term ripple effects of exposing our citizens to a disease that we do not completely understand. I know our economy is hurting, and I've seen many businesses adapt by thinking outside the box in order to survive. Also, we need to build up our infrastructure and education workforce to accommodate teaching kids at home and in smaller classroom settings with limited contact and no large congregations until we have an approved vaccine. Face masks do mitigate the spread and should not be a political statement. For one group of people, the issue is about money and funding, while the other, it's about dignity and the rights. We can start by decriminalizing minor offenses, add more training and de-escalation. There should not be officers with excessive force complaints against them policing in communities. But these kinds of questions should be asked directly to the people of the community that they police. You need to choose your battles wisely. Our First Amendment rights guarantees us peaceful protests, and 93% of the protests across this country have been peaceful, with 0% of the violent ones here in Florida. The next protest could be some that are focused on views as injustice that law will be used against them. Be careful of heading down a slippery slope. That concludes the questions. Now time for the closing statement. Hi, I'm Angela Hoover. I'm candidate for State Representative District 3. I'm running to bring unity, community, and a better place to live to my constituents in Florida. My platform is based on three things that are important to everybody in my district, regardless of your party affiliation. The importance of the economy, because it affects all of us, no matter what our stature is in life. The environment, which does affect everyone in Florida, and especially because it relates to the economy with our tourism industry and our agricultural industry, which are our two main industries in our state. And then the last is infrastructure, which is the support both of the economy and the environment. As Americans, we have more that unites us than divides us. I would like to be that candidate that goes to work hard every day, not seeking the limelight, but to do the hard work and fight for our community and the district that I hope to serve. I hope you'll give me your vote. Thank you. That was Ms. Angela L. Hoover, and that concludes the race for Florida House District 3. Coming up on Rally, we'll have the races for State Senate District 1, State House District 4, and Okaloosa County Commissioner District 5. That's coming up right after this break.
Thank you for joining us. There are three ways to cast a ballot in Okaloosa County, by mail, early voting, or at your precinct on election day. To vote by mail, ballots must reach the Supervisor of Elections office by 7 p.m. on election day. The general election takes place on Tuesday, November 3rd. The U.S. Postal Service recommends allowing at least one week for mail delivery. The supervisor's offices are located in Crestview and Shalimar, where you can also deliver your ballot in person. Additionally, you may use the drop boxes at an early voting site during early voting hours. Early voting began on Monday, October 19th and continues through Saturday, October 31st at the five locations listed on screen. Hours for early voting are 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. each day. Early voting takes place in Destin, Shalimar, Niceville, and at two locations in Crestview. Signature and photo ID are required. On the day of the general election, Tuesday, November 3rd, voting takes place at your polling location from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. You must vote in the precinct in which you live and are registered. Be sure to bring photo and signature ID with you. Welcome back and thank you for joining us here on WSRE for Rally 2020. The general election is coming up November 3rd and tonight we're introducing you to the candidates who will be on the ballot. We have just a few more races left tonight, including State Representative District 4 and State Senator District 1. Right now we turn to the race for Okaloosa County Commissioner District 5. There are two candidates in this contest. We'll introduce them to you in alphabetical order. The first candidate is Mr. Wes Fell with no party affiliation. The next candidate is Mr. Mel Ponder, Republican. Mr. Fell is not attending rally. Mr. Ponder answered two questions provided to us by the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa and Walton counties. The first question is, the COVID-19 pandemic shows no signs of abating and colder weather will drive everyone back inside where transmission rates are higher. What specific measures do you support to ensure public safety going forward? Please address enforcement of public safety provisions. The second question is, in 2018, Okaloosa County residents approved a 10-year half-cent sales tax that is specifically intended to fund, quote, essential improvements in infrastructure. Would you support using some of the sales tax revenue to increase availability of affordable housing in the county? If not, how do you propose to address the lack of affordable housing in our county? Now we'll hear from Mr. Mel Ponder. Thank you so much. Uh, great question. I'm honored to be with everyone tonight. Um, as regard to the pandemic, it's affected all of us. In Okaloosa County, of which I'm running for the seat in uh, County Commission District 5, we've had over 5,300 positive test cases, over 120 have passed. Everyone that passes is a completely serious and tragic. Um, with the upcoming uh, cold season around the corner, that's expected influenza will uh, cause rates even to go higher. You know, our, our rates have kind of ebbed and flowed as of late. Some have caught up a little bit uh, when school went back, um, but right now they're kind of plateauing a little bit, but we got to take it serious coming into the fall. And so for us, I think Okaloosa County has done an amazing job uh, to take this thing extremely serious. Um, when they were given a chance to maybe put in some mandates, they opted not to and made every business, you know, put a sign out front. Uh, do you want to accept it or not? You know, when Okaloosa County passed the half cent sales tax, there were three primary functions of that. Uh, infrastructure, public safety, and stormwater. Unfortunately, within infrastructure, the definition does not include room for affordable housing. So one of the things I'm gonna proceed to move forward with is working with county staff. You know, the county just took back <laughs> Uh, March of 2019 affordable housing because it had been contracted out before. I will say even this year alone through, uh, through the CARES Act and other means within affordable housing uh, sector, we've given out over a million dollars, almost a million and a half dollars to help those with affordable housing needs tied to COVID and other matters having to do with that situation. So I plan on working with county staff, putting out perhaps a 10 year plan on things we can do to move forward in order to tackle affordable housing in Okaloosa County. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. 
Hey, I'm Mel Ponder, and I want to thank the residents of Okaloosa County for giving me the incredible honor to serve you the last four years in Tallahassee as your state representative of House District 4. For those that don't know, I came from local government. I was a city councilman and mayor in the city of Destin, and when Captain Kelly Wines made the hard call to retire from Okaloosa County District 5, it created an open seat. For me, with my family being so important, I saw this as an open opportunity to come back to serve in local government where I started. And for those that know me, um, there's four pillars under which I'm running. I think it's important as constituents, you know, because it's from those positions I'll, and from the lens of those positions, I'll make my decisions. And those are family, faith, freedom, forward. Again, family, faith, freedom, forward. Family, it's preserving and protecting the culture of family that we so honor and cherish within Okaloosa County. Faith validating the faith-based community and giving them a seat at the, at the table. So often the faith-based community is thought of afterwards. I wanna validate them and honor them for the work they do as well. Freedom, honoring our fighting men and women, preserving and protecting the mission of the military. Also outside of that, those freedoms that we so honor with our constitutional rights, our constitutional freedoms. From a personal standpoint, mental health, further working on our freedoms for mental health. Also from a business and regulatory standpoint, removing those hindrances to those that want to get into the market. And so that is uh, freedom. Then forward, it's what we do going forward. It's getting our hands around the budget, making sure that we're good uh, stewards over the assets we have there. It's also infrastructure, not only in the things we're doing already around Crestview and the, and the bypass, but also needs we have on the south end of the county, Fort Walton, Destin, and other points in between. Also, workforce development and an education partner to make sure we're tra our transitioning military and those coming up have an opportunity to be trained right in Okaloosa County and things like sports tourism. So family, faith, freedom forward. Mel Ponder, I'd be honored to serve as your next county commissioner, District 5, November 3rd. Thank you so much. That was Mr. Mel Ponder, and that wraps up the race for Okaloosa County Commissioner District 5. Now we'll meet the candidates for State Representative District 4, which covers Okaloosa County, and there are two candidates in this race, Mr. Pat Maney, Republican, and Mr. John Plant, Democrat. Mr. Pat Maney is not attending rally. The two questions answered by Mr. Plant were also provided by the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa and Walton Counties. The first question is, will you advocate and support additional funding to fix the state's inadequate electronic system for applications, as well as payment of unemployment benefits? Why or why not? The second question is, will you champion a ban specifically on matrix acidizing since it poses such a threat to our aquifers and the panhandle is one of only two places in the state where it can be conducted. Why or why not? Here's Mr. John Plank. Absolutely. I think it's a matter of care. Not only do I support additional funding for these systems, I support funding to also provide protections to keep these systems online during times of stress. I'm a former foster parent. I volunteer in the community and support organizations. And it's really easy for people to fall from a position of strength to a position of vulnerability in these times. And I think it's up to us as a population to keep our community strong and provide these protections to keep those communities strong. I absolutely would support a ban on it. I'm not aware of any efforts to use matrix acidation in our area. But uh, Florida is a brand, and when you have environmental eff effects uh, affecting Florida and its citizens, it diminishes that brand. And um, we want to keep our environment clean, healthy for tourism, and tourism is a vital, vital part of our economy. Plus, we don't want to introduce additional risks to our area in terms of chemicals leaking into the groundwater. We already have issues with um, wastewater runoff and sewage leakage into our ocean. So I don't see any potential benefit from adding additional risk. There are other ways by improving our infrastructure, we can actually bring jobs to the economy. That concludes the questions. Now it's time for the closing statement. Hi, my name is John Plant. I'm running for Florida State House District 4. I'm not a politician. I'm a software engineer by trade. I'm a lead of leads. Um, I'm a family man. I got uh, 
four kids. Two of them we adopted out of foster care. They uh, both have special needs, so I understand how difficult it can be from families with uh, foster needs, foster special needs kids to uh, adapt to the environment around them and some of the difficulties in finding health care. I've worked in multiple industries. Um, I've worked in corporations ranging in size from small startups to multinational corporations. I've also worked at Brookhaven National Laboratory. It is a large government facility covering 278 acres uh, where I supported multiple uh, facilities. I have a master's in Homeland Security which will come in handy given the number of uh, tropical storms we've had this year among other disasters like the pandemic. I volunteer in the community. I understand how fragile life can be for many people and how quickly the strength of a family can turn on a dime. I think we can do better in terms of providing support systems for families. I want to improve education in our, in our area. It should help with our job recovery. And I want to lean into infrastructure projects while our businesses are recovering. So as businesses come back online, people have a way to get income and we strengthen our community. I am online at johnforflorida.com. I'm also on most social media at John for Florida. Thank you, I'm John Plant. I'm running for Florida State House District 4. Do not forget to vote November 3rd. And that was Mr. John Plant, and that concludes the race for Florida Representative District 4. Still ahead tonight, the race for Florida Senate District 1. We'll return right after this break. On the November ballot, there are six amendments to the Florida Constitution. A 60% margin is required for passage. Here's a brief look at what each amendment covers. Amendment 1, citizenship requirement to vote in Florida elections. The ballot summary reads as follows. This amendment provides that only United States citizens who are at least 18 years of age, a permanent resident of Florida, and registered to vote, as provided by law, shall be qualified to vote in a Florida election. Amendment 2, raising Florida's minimum wage. The ballot summary reads as follows. Raises minimum wage to $10 per hour effective September 30th, 2021. Each September 30th thereafter, minimum wage shall increase by $1 per hour until the minimum wage reaches $15 per hour on September 30th, 2026. From that point forward, future minimum wage increases shall revert to being adjusted annually for inflation starting September 30th, 2027. Amendment 3, all voters vote in primary elections for state legislature, governor, and cabinet. The ballot summary reads as follows, allows all registered voters to vote in primaries for state legislature, governor, and cabinet regardless of political party affiliation. All candidates for an office, including party-nominated candidates, appear on the same primary ballot. Two highest vote getters advance to general election. If only two candidates qualify, no primary is held, and the winner is determined in the general election. Candidates party affiliation may appear on the ballot as provided by law, and that's effective January 1, 2024. Amendment 4, Voter Approval of Constitutional Amendments. The ballot summary reads as follows. Requires all proposed amendments or revisions to the state constitution to be approved by the voters in two elections instead of one in order to take effect. The proposal applies the current thresholds for passage to each of the two elections. Amendment 5, Limitations on Homestead Property Tax Assessments. Increased portability period to transfer accrued benefit. The ballot summary reads as follows. Proposing an amendment to the state constitution, effective January 1st, 2021, to increase from two years to three years, the period of time during which accrued Save Our Homes benefits may be transferred from a prior homestead to a new homestead. Amendment six, ad valorem tax discount for spouses of certain deceased veterans who had permanent combat related disabilities. The ballot summary reads as follows provides that the homestead property tax discount for certain veterans with permanent combat-related disabilities carries over to such veterans' surviving spouse who holds legal or beneficial title to and who permanently resides on the homestead property until he or she remarries or sells or otherwise disposes of the property. The discount may be transferred to a new homestead property of the surviving spouse under certain conditions. The amendment takes effect January 1st, 2021. 
If you'd like more detailed nonpartisan information, you can access the Florida League Voters Guide. Just log on to the website for the League of Women Voters of Florida at lwvfl.org forward slash amendments. Scroll down to the bottom of the web page to the voter guide and single page voting tool, then click on the 2020 nonpartisan voter guide. The guide will display a synopsis of the amendments and an explanation of what a yes or a no vote will mean. Welcome back and thank you again for joining us tonight for WSRE's Rally 2020 as we count down to General Election Day coming up November 3rd. Finally tonight, we turn to the race for Florida Senator District 1. This district includes Escambia, Santa Rosa, and a portion of Okaloosa County. There are two candidates in this race. In alphabetical order, they are Mr. Douglas V. Broxson, Republican, and Ms. Karen M. Butler, Democrat. Mr. Broxson is not attending rally. Ms. Butler will answer the following two questions provided by the League of Women Voters and then make her final statement. The first question is this. The pandemic has created adverse health and economic consequences for Floridians. What specific solutions do you support to deal with both of these problems? The second question is, in response to the killing of George Floyd and the resulting social unrest, what changes are needed to the laws that govern criminal justice in Florida? Here is Ms. Karen M. Butler with her responses. Not only do I support an expanded Medicaid program, I think there should be an emergency fund for catastrophic things such as a pandemic to help people through the process. For example, if they have lost their jobs and their health care at the same time, it can financially ruin a family. Or we could even provide a no interest loan with an extended repayment period. That could help a family get through the duration of a pandemic. That is something that I would actually propose uh, in legislation if elected to the Florida Senate. When people participate in civil unrest, it's because something has gone terribly wrong. The media is focusing on people protesting instead of their message on why they are protesting. You need to listen to what they're saying. I don't believe that police departments should be defunded. I believe that they should be provided cultural diversity, sensitivity, uh, training to help them deal with certain situations so that people aren't killed because what happened to George Floyd should never happen to another person of color. That concludes the questions. Now time for the closing statement. Hello, my name is Karen Butler and I am a 20 year United States Air Force and Gulf War veteran, retiring right here in the Panhandle from Eglin Air Force Base. I'm also a 21 year real estate professional specializing in military relocations and I am your candidate for the Florida Senate for District 1, which includes Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Okaloosa counties. My platform includes expanding health care to include homeless veterans, because homeless and veteran should never ever be used in the same sentence. We pick the best, bravest, and the brightest to go and fight our wars, and then when they come back broken and bruised, they're cast aside like old Christmas toys. Many are discharged without any benefits, suffering from things like PTSD and a variety of other illnesses with nowhere to turn and nowhere to go. They are your friends and loved ones and they deserve better and we owe them so much more. Escambia County is the most environmentally toxic county in the entire state and our beautiful Gulf of Mexico now has a 5,000 square mile dead zone because there are corporations who are poisoning our air, our land, and water. 
every day and have been going unchecked for years. If elected to the Senate, these are just some of the things I will address. I want to close the talent workforce gap and bring in training programs so that we can bring in more and better paying jobs. And I want to make sure that when we suffer from natural disasters, the people of Northwest Florida don't have to wait weeks and months for aid. My name is Karen Butler, and I am your candidate for the Florida Senate. That was Ms. Karen M. Butler, and that wraps up our final race. We thank you for joining us for Rally 2020, provided by WSRE, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Special thanks to Pensacola State College for supporting this program and to the League of Women Voters, Pensacola Bay Area, as well as the League of Women Voters of Okaloosa and Walton Counties for providing the questions answered by our candidates. You can watch the candidate statements on our website or on YouTube. And remember, early voting is underway through October 31st, and all mail-in and absentee ballots must be returned by Election Day, November 3rd. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great night.